Hey everyone, welcome back to the Agatha Christie reread from Vassals of Kingsgrave. My name is Bina007, this is episode 11, it's a mini pod, and we'll be discussing the 1930 book Murder at the Vicarage. Written, or rather published, just as Agatha Christie married Max Mallowan, her second husband, and the one that would be with her until her death. Published when she was 40 years old, under a new imprint called the Collins Crime Club that was basically invented for Agatha Christie. So she is really a great commercially bankable name at this point. Personally happy and entering some of the most lucrative and memorable years of her writing. This is the decade, 1930 to 1940, where she's going to publish 18 novels and many short stories, including some of her most admired works. The other reason why Murder at the Vicarage is probably famous is it's the first long story in which we are introduced to Miss Marple, who, along with Hercule Poirot, um, are really the two most famous detectives that Agatha Christie invented. And I have to confess that I am a Hercule Poirot fan, both in books and on screen. I've never really been that attracted to Miss Marple, maybe because the locations of her novels aren't as glamorous. But um, this was a real challenge, I must admit, to get through Murder at the Vicarage. I found the first half of it really a struggle, but the, the density and intricacy of the plot and the human nature study, I think, really won me over by the end. So it's a book I struggled with and then completed all in a rush. The murder is absolutely the caricature of what people think of with Agatha Christie. It is a village in England. It is between the wars and this is a very middle class milieu. Um, The narrator is a vicar. (laughs) He has married a younger wife called Griselda and there's a lot of comedy about their marriage. He feels that she's younger, maybe doesn't find him as exciting and as attractive and that she could be going off with someone else. Um, And they have a curate, so a young cleric in their parish called Hawes, who seems very nervous, seems to take a lot of headache powders, and the vicar's a little bit worried he's going to be addicted to them. The victim of the murder is Colonel Prothero. I guess in the post-World War I era, there'd be a lot of people with military titles running around the village. And he's meant to be very particular, um, rather unforgiving, and he is shot in the back of the head in the vicar's study. So very middle class. Um, He has rather a complex private life, the dead colonel. He is very rich. He had a first marriage and has a daughter by that first marriage called Lettuce Prothero, rather a ridiculous name. And she's kind of a bright young thing, a little bit very pretty, rather vacant, very underestimated. Um, But we realise there's more to her than that, as is often the case with Agatha Christie's pretty young girls. And Colonel Prothero married a second wife called Anne Prothero, who we're meant to understand as being very pretty too, much younger, and the relationships between stepmother and stepdaughter are a little bit frosty. Now, elsewhere in the village, there are a couple of characters that are of note, uh, many others actually, that a lot of the television Um, adaptations slim down but the ones we need to note are the painter Lawrence Redding now he's seen as this bohemian this sort of otherworldly very devilishly handsome character that comes into the village and everyone wonders who he might or might not be having an affair with Um, he's seen to be very charming and significantly Chekhov's gun he does have a gun that he keeps. Um, again, maybe this is a feature of post-World War One life. We've discussed in previous episodes how Agatha Christie's novels are very much bracketed by the wars. And so having colonels in the village and guns on the loose is something that you would see. The other person who's, a, who's new to the village is Mrs. Lestrange. Um, a woman of a certain age were taken to believe rather handsome, rather good looking, 
and keeps herself to herself, um, doesn't really mix with people in the village and again is subject to rumours. You know, who is she there for? Why is she turned up? Is she blackmailing one of the villagers? So those are the main characters. And then we have a number of side characters, including a number of spinsters in the village of whom Miss Marple is one. And Miss Marple is the kind of busybody who isn't liked. She kind of underplays her own intelligence and is always making comments such as, oh, isn't it so clever how men arrange these sorts of things? But really secretly um, knows herself to be superior in intelligence to them. No one seems to like her, actually. She doesn't really seem to have any friends. Even the vicar's younger wife, Griselda, who's who's great fun um, and really is one of the more sympathetic characters in the book, describes her early on as a cat and not in a good way, like like a really just a bitch. Um, no one likes her. But she is going to be our detective. And really, she comes at this novel rather from the side. She's not the narrator. She's not called in as a policeman or like a Pro as a, a private detective. She makes very fleeting little appearances up until the end when she re- we realise that she and indeed the vicar himself are the ones who really are trying to get to the secret of really what happened. And we realise by the end that she is quite remarkable as a woman, although not likeable and not at all twee and not at all um, sort of cutesy, charming English villagey. And I think a lot of what we see on TV in this, this these Miss Marple adaptations really is unfair to what the books are. The books are far spikier and nastier and darker and more sinister. And I think that's really, it's really a pleasant surprise when you read them. So as I say, the plot unfolds. We have the murder of Colonel Prothero, the police inspector, Inspector Slack is called in. And very quickly, we see that Lawrence Redding says that he did it. Um, And we think maybe we're in one of those double indemnity kind of situations. And then almost equally as quickly, we realise that he didn't. He has an alibi of sorts and is let off. But the gossip in the village is that in doing so, in coming forward as the murderer, we have now exposed the fact that Lawrence wasn't sleeping with a young, pretty lettuce Prothero, but actually with Anne Prothero, the dead man's wife. So we have a sordid affair going on in the village. Um, We also have some other mysterious stuff. So we have some items that have been stolen from the dead dead man's house. We have an an archaeologist in the village and his young female secretary, Miss Cram. Is she having an affair with him? We have a mysterious hidden bag of goods that's gone astray uh, with a young maid who works for the vicar. We have all sorts of sort of little side mysteries that must be cleared up before we can get to the murder mystery. Not least why the vicar's young wife, Griselda, is seemingly lying about the train that she got back from London on. So all sorts of things going on, which I think are actually resolved in an incredibly intricate and satisfying way. I think in in pure puzzle terms, this is one of the more satisfactory, maybe one of the more satisfactory since the murder of Roger Ackroyd. I really think this is a tremendously well plotted book. Now, it must be said that at the time, this book wasn't reviewed particularly well. The Times Literary Supplement, um, you know, says that it's been a bit drawn out. Uh, quote, it is Miss Marple who does detect the murderer in the end, but one suspects she would have done it sooner in reality. The New York Times book review says the talented Miss Christie is far from being at her best in the latest mystery story. The solution is a distinct anti-climax. The Daily Express, Harold Nicholson, very famous reviewer, said, I've read better works by Agatha Christie, but that does not mean that this last book is not more cheerful, more amusing and more seductive than the generality of detective novels. How condescending of him. So in general, people weren't very happy with it. And weirdly enough, Agatha Christie herself later wrote, reading Murder at the Vicarage now, I'm not so pleased with it as I was at the time. It has, I think, far too many characters and too many subplots. But at any rate, the main plot is sound. And actually, I think she probably is right there. I think there are too many sort of silly side plots. It's only 300 pages as normal. But I do think you can cut some of those characters out. But I think the main plot is beyond sound. I think it is really, really very good. And so it is interesting to see how 
later adaptations have focused on its real strength, which is the main plot. As always, when we do these little mini pods, we discuss how well the book holds up as a work of fiction against contemporary standards. There is some fun to be had there. I think the shock of Miss Crabbe being a female secretary to a single man does strike one as a little bit bizarre now. You know, we're very far away from those imperialist uh, thrillers and adventure stories that Agatha Christie wrote in the 1920s. Everything's calmed down a little bit. It isn't quite so unbelievable and wild. But are we meant to take seriously that Mrs Lestrange's first husband was a missionary that was literally eaten (laughs) in Africa and that Dr Haydock rescued her from being a white slave? Um, Yeah, I think that's a little bit silly. It, It reminded me... A little bit of when you read those Evelyn War novels of the bright young things and there's always, you know, the white slavers in the background. But that's it, really. Actually, this novel is pleasantly free from a lot of the misogyny and anti-Semitism and imperialist colonialist racism that can colour some of those earlier novels. It's a much more nuanced and sophisticated novel in how it judges human nature and is all the better for that. And I think that's really summed up in the character of Miss Marple herself. And I just want to read, when we finally realise that she truly is at the heart of this novel, it's very late on, you know, it's in the final 20 or so pages that we realise her true nature. And this is Agatha Christie describing Miss Marple, and I think it's it's masterful. You see, she began at last, living alone, as I do, in a rather out-of-the-way part of the world, one has to have a hobby. There is, of course, wool work and guides and welfare and sketching, but my hobby is and always has been human nature, so varied and so very fascinating. And, of course, in a small village with nothing to distract one, One has such ample opportunity for becoming what I might call proficient in one's study. You see there, she's being rather humble. One begins to class people quite definitely, just as though they were birds or flowers, groups so-and-so, genius this, species that. Sometimes, of course, one makes mistakes, but less and less as time goes on. And then, too, one tests oneself. One takes a little problem, for instance, the gill of pickled shrimps that amused de Griselda so much, a quite unimportant mystery, but absolutely incomprehensible, unless one solves it right. And then there was the matter of the changed cough drops and the butcher's wife's umbrella, the last absolutely meaningless, unless on the assumption that the greengrocer was not behaving at all nicely with the chemist's wife, which of course turned out to be the case. There you go, the arrogance again, but also the rather polite reference to naughty goings on in society. It is so fascinating, you know, to apply one's judgment and find that one is right. You usually are, I believe, I said, smiling. That's the cleric. Miss Marple again. That, I am afraid, is what has made me a little conceited, confessed Miss Marple. She has that in common with Alcule Poirot. But I've also, I've always wondered whether if someday a really big mystery came along, should I be able to do the same thing? I mean, just solve it correctly logically it ought to be exactly the same thing after all a tiny working model of a torpedo is just the same as a real torpedo surely it must be the same said miss marple the what one used to call the factors at school are the same there's money and the mutual attraction between people and an opposite sex and there's queerness of course so many people are a little queer aren't they In fact, most people, when you know them well, and normal people do such astonishing things sometimes, and abnormal people are sometimes so very sane and ordinary. In fact, the only way is to compare people with other people you have known or come across. You'd be surprised if you knew how very few distinct types there are in all. So there you go. I feel that in that, Miss Marple really shows you exactly what she's about. I think all this just speaks to what a fascinating character Miss Marple is, because she, unlike Sherlock Holmes or Hercule Poirot or all these other detectives, is someone who is just an overlooked, underappreciated spinster living in the middle of nowhere in a village where nothing ever happens, where her only um, training and detection has been working out someone's having an affair because of something entirely trivial. And she's not liked. She sits at home, she knits, she builds a rock garden, she observes everything. And actually her observation, the fact that she is this bored person who whiles away her time by observing everything, is used against her by the murderer, which is the ultimate cheek. Um, I think it's just a great 
use of a detective. And I think, you know, Agatha Christie, as she is a woman who's moving into middle age, no longer as attractive as she once was, maybe has an appreciation for these overlooked and underestimated, underestimated women that makes her a really radically subversive and progressive woman. Lettuce Prothero isn't a total airhead. Um, and Miss Marple isn't just a bitchy, snide, presumptuous woman. And I think both of them in different ways play the men in their lives as well, which is quite interesting. You know, Miss Marple fusses over her young nephew, Raymond West, who's a modern poet of whom we'll hear more, and seems to be very subservient towards his needs, but actually undercuts him um, and his supposed intelligence. So I, I don't know, I just think that there's something about the Miss Marple on the page that I think is so much more fascinating than the Miss Marple on the screen. Maybe that's a great segue to get to the screen adaptations of this novel. So there is a 1986 adaptation by the BBC starring Joan Hickson, who I think lots of people will know as Miss Marple um, and is probably closer to the books because she's a little bit drier, a little bit less cosy and cuddly than some of the later adaptations. As an adaptation, it stars Paul Eddington as the vicar, Polly Adams as Anne Prothero. It is very close to the original novel, but there are some changes, and most of the changes are about trimming down some of the extra characters. I found it rather dusty and rather slow and rather rather old school. I mean, it comes across as rather flat on the screen to a modern viewer. I didn't really enjoy watching it. Um, but it does have some, some of the spikiness of Miss Marple in there, but I think still does the book a disservice. And then there was a more recent adaptation, but my goodness, still nearly 20 years old. So maybe we're due for a new one, TV people. Um, it was part of the Agatha Christie's Marple series made by ITV, so the the other big British network broadcaster. It starred Geraldine McEwen as Miss Marple, and I find her Miss Marple far more jolly, far more mischievous, far more knowing, far more meta and modern. Again, I think not quite right, because I think there is a sort of nasty conceitedness in the book that we don't quite get with Geraldine McEwen. It stars Tim McKinney, known to Blackadder fans um, as the vicar, Derek Jacobi as Colonel Prothero, and Janet McAteer as Anne Prothero. And I think all those three are great actors. So it's a brilliant cast. Janet McAteer in particular, absolutely superb. We don't have, again, the character of the archaeologist and the lady secretary, and that always seems to disappear from these adaptations. But we do have a new couple of French characters. And weirdly, I hate when they do this, and the Kenneth Branagh films of Hercule Poirot does this as well, they introduce an, a sort of a backstory love affair for Miss Marple. Why must they insist on giving these people love lives and romanticism? When actually they're rather spikier, nastier, more selfish characters than all of that. So, yeah, I'm not really a fan of that adaptation either. And what I, I also really don't like is that in both novels, uh, sorry, in both adaptations, they don't have the confidence to let the vicar be the prime investigator and to let Miss Marple really be someone who approaches it from the side, who sort of is on the periphery of our vision and then slowly comes into full view by the end. And I guess it's because, you know, this is a headline series of Miss Marple, so that they can't do that. But I think that's the joy of this book. The joy of this book is Agatha Christie not only um, deceiving us as to who did the murder, but also deceiving us as to the role of Miss Marple, because she allows us to, like everyone else in the village, write her off as an interfering peripheral busybody until we see her hove into view. It must have been quite something to read this the first time before Miss Marple was a thing, before she was an iconic detective, and only by the end realise that this is this is what was happening to you. In a sense, this is the biggest sleight of hand of the whole book. So it's a shame that none of the TV adaptations, A, films in order, why don't they just do them in order? And B, doesn't do this with Miss Marple and give us that big reveal. So I would say read the book because the book is actually much more clever and much more spiky and interesting than the adaptations. OK, I'm going to give you a little bit of chat about the ending after the end credits of this podcast. Um, in the meantime, whatever you're reading this weekend, I hope you really enjoy it. The next book we're going to cover is the next book that she wrote in long form detective, because actually she did do Giant's Bread in between, which was one of her Mary Westmacott novels. 
And that is the Sitterford mystery. So you're in for a little bit of spooky Halloween themed gorgeousness. Um, if you like Sher- if you like the Hound of the Baskervilles, Sherlock Holmes, that sort of spooky mystery, then the Sitterford mystery is one for you. But anyway, have a lovely weekend and spoilers after the end music. <laughs> Okay, folks, we're back. As I kind of gave away in that little um, extract that I read about Miss Marple, the motives in Agatha Christie are always rather commonplace, and they're typically either sex or money or both. And that's very true here, isn't it? Passion and money, her most reliable motives. Um, definitely the case in The Mysterious Ferret Styles will go on to be the case in some of her other very famous novels that we haven't covered yet, so I won't mention here. But really, there are four or five major novels where we are treated to a couple of people who are having an affair that we don't realise are having an affair at the time that we're reading, being in it together and providing each other crucially with alibis. So this is a plot um, device that Agatha Christie will use time and again. There's also a sort of a minor subplot that will be recycled, which is the use of unreliable clocks or the idea that someone has clocks that are wound fast or wound slow and that someone else will change the clock. And that's something, again, that will be used in a couple of other novels that we haven't yet covered. Um, But as always with Agatha Christie, follow the money and follow the sex and uh, in many cases, follow both.